Cavalcade of America. Conservation has a special appeal for everyone who loves the great outdoors. There are many things in our national life worth conserving. Not only our forests and streams and other natural resources, but also the fundamentals of American character and American ideals that have been ever present in the cavalcade of America. Such ideals are being perpetuated today by earnest, sincere Americans throughout the land. Among them, the research chemists in their laboratories whose unselfish devotion to science is well expressed by the pledge of DuPont chemists, better things for better living through chemistry. The DuPont Cavalcade Orchestra rings up the curtain on this evening's program with a special arrangement of a well-known American composition, Oscar Rosbach's beautiful setting of Joyce Kilmer's poem, Three.
As you watch the American cavalcade pass by, you are impressed that its leaders are builders rather than conquerors. They have cultivated the wilderness and made it blossom with the fruits of civilization. They have planted and protected. They have conserved America's resources. High among our unsung heroes stands John Chapman, known to his own generation by his nickname, Johnny Appleseed. Let us turn back the pages of history to the end of the 1790s. A covered wagon heading west toward the Ohio wilderness stops just outside the sprawling village of Pittsburgh, where a gray cabin stands in a flowering orchard. Oh, oh there, oh there. Looks for all the world like a bit of little old Rhode Island, doesn't it? Apple blossom. Oh, Nathaniel. It makes me so homesick. Oh. Morning, friends. Oh, good morning to you, sir. Is this the place they told us we'd find water? Yep. Soft right over yonder. Well, thank you. Wouldn't you like to get down, ma'am, and rest yourself a minute while your husband's watering the team? Why, yes, I would. Wait, wait, I'll help you, ma'am. Oh, thank you. Oh, it's so beautiful, this orchard. So unexpected. I didn't know there was anything like this around here. Gabriel, Gabriel, well, no. there wasn't when I come here. That was the first thing that struck me, too. No fruit trees anywhere. I, I'd been raised in New England, you see. Tell me, will there be apple trees in Ohio, do you think? Someday. But not now. Well, Ohio is pretty much a wilderness, you know, ma'am. Yes. Nice place you have here, friend. Well. I hate to leave it. It seems so peaceful and secure. We'll have a place just like this someday, my dear, in Ohio. But it'll be so long. Oh, don't take long to clear land and build a cabin. No, but for trees to grow. <laughs> we'll be felling trees, not planting them. Say, hey, I wish you would plant some. Plant some? I'd be glad to give you a bag of apple seeds from own fruit here. Apple seeds? Yes, ma'am. W would you like to take some with you? Oh, we certainly We'll have no time for growing fruit trees, Susan, in the wilderness. I'll find time. Apple trees in the wilderness. Oh, then it will be home. After that, whenever a party of pioneers on their way to the Ohio Territory stopped at his place for water, he gave them, in parting, a little bag of apple seeds. His gift for the homes they were so bravely going out to settle. Johnny the Appleseed Man, they grew to call him. One night in the autumn of 1800, a trader from Ohio stopped at Johnny. Come in. Are you the Appleseed Man? Yes, sir, that's what they call me. Brought your letter from some folks out in Ohio. Oh, well. Uh, here it is. Thank you, sir, thank you. I, uh... Oh. Bad news? Yeah. Someone dead? All of them. You mean massacred? I don't know what it was. Drought or weeds or something. What, what are you talking about, man? Apple seed. <laughs> Is that all? Yeah, it's the same story everywhere. Nobody's had any luck growing them. You see that pile of letters yonder on the shelf? Yes. Well, they're all from folks that I've trusted seeds to on the way out west. They're asking you to send them more seeds? No, no. It wouldn't do no good if it did. Men are too busy out in the wilderness. You know, fruit trees, fruit trees is like, like children. You got to watch over them and nurse them and, and love them to make them grow. Yeah, but once they get started... Oh, yes. If I could only get them started, if I... Say, say, I could... I, I could go out there myself and, and start orchards all through Ohio. <laughs> Guess you don't know how big Ohio is, brother. I know. <laughs> or how wild. The settlement's bringing up, though. Yes, I, I could go from one to another, planting seeds and teaching folks how to take care of them. There'd be no money in it for you. But there'll be the knowledge that I've helped give folks real homes, like this one of mine, that I've, that I've took the first step towards making the wilderness bloom and bear fruit. God willing, I'll do it. In the little settlement of Marietta, Ohio, 
There lived at the beginning of the 19th century one Dr. True. Here in the spring of 1801, John Chapman is brought, ill and delirious with malarial fever, and tenderly nursed by the good doctor and his Negro servant. Uh, I see. Where, where are my apple seeds? He's been moaning and muttering about seeds ever since we done found them. Where, where are my apple seeds? Well, here's the sack you had with you, mister. That's what you want. My, my apple seeds, they're, they're safe. No, no, you lie quiet, my friend. I, I must be dreaming. Seems like I smell apple blossom. <laughs> you do? It's my tree outside. It's in full bloom. It's an apple tree here? The only one in Ohio. But how, how... I brought it with me when I came out here seven years ago. You should see it now. It reached full bearing? Yes. I expect this year to have a fine crop of no, apples. No, no, that tree of yours ain't going to give you no crop of apples this season. No, no, for many a season, Doctor. What? It's got more important work to do. You're, you're going to strip it of its choicest buds every year. But, but why should I? I'll show you how to do the budding and grafting if you don't know. Well, who are you, anyway? My name's John Chapman. I, I come from Pittsburgh. Johnny Appleseed. The Appleseed man. Praise be. Oh, you've heard then. Well, such news travels fast. All over Ohio, folks are waiting for you, Johnny. For you and your seed. Well, I won't disappoint him. Thank the Lord you pulled him through, Doctor. It's a wonder we did. Man, you should be more careful. Wading through swamps, sleeping on the ground. Why, wow, he ain't even got a hole. Well, I'll see that he has one when he leaves here. No. You're mighty kind, Doctor. But I don't want it. All I ask of you is to let me have some shoots from that tree of yours to start my first orchard. And in a few years, God willing, every home for miles around here will be enjoying the fruit and the glory of an apple tree. Almost half a century, Johnny Appleseed labored in the wilderness, planting, nurturing, teaching, and overseeing. In 1843, we find him a white-haired man of 78, with flowing beard and deep-set eyes, the home of some old friends in Indiana. With a piece of charred wood from the hearth, he is sketching a rough map on the white pine table. Yes, yes, these, these are the routes the next immigration will take. Into the northwest. There the roots I'll follow. Johnny, you're not going out there. Oh, you're not as young as you once was. <laughs> I I don't count years, ma'am, except as planting season. And you're ill. No, no, just a cold I caught. Yeah, going out to care for your trees in a storm. You always did think more of your trees than of yourself, Johnny. They're my children. Listen, Johnny. You ain't had a home of any kind for almost 50 years, and you love one so. Stay here with us and enjoy one for the rest of your life. Oh, do, Johnny. And, and what about all the folks that's moving further west to make their home? Well, there'll be nurserymen going out there later on. Yeah, in another generation. That's what they always say. But it's this generation. Well, where are my seeds, ma'am, and my tools? Johnny, don't go. Funny... Funny how heavy this bag feels today. Oh, Johnny, you are sick. No, no, just a kind of weakness. I'll be all right as soon as I get on the road again. Mother, he mustn't go. He's old and sick. You can't suffer for it like his, my dear. Well, I'll be coming back some spring. Goodbye, old friend. Goodbye, Johnny. Goodbye, ma'am. Goodbye. Towards the setting sun and the new wilderness. We'll never see him again, Mother. We'll see him every spring, my dear, when the trees begin to blossom. He'll be with us every winter as we gather around our fireside. He'll be in the homes of folk all over this great land and in the homes of our children and their children's children. Johnny Appleseed may pass on. His name may even be forgotten. The fruits of his labor will live forever. Johnny Appleseed 
has become a legendary figure. And today it is claimed that the many apple orchards of Ohio may well be called the direct descendants of the trees that he planted so faithfully. The Cavalcade of America, presented by DuPont, moves on. Throughout the land today, much effort is devoted to conserving and restoring our wasted timberlands, which have fallen before the woodsman's axe. Thousands of men guard the nation's timber heritage. Night and day, winter and summer, they patrol the forest preserves, guarding against fire. Fires often caused by such careless disregard as that of two motorists speeding through one of our great national parks. comes another ticket. You might as well stop and get it. I don't think Forrest Wayne just can give speed tickets. Well, we'll soon find out. Can't you men read? Well, I'm sorry, officer. I didn't realize. Oh, no, don't try to tell me that. You don't smoke without realizing it. Smoke? Exactly. Haven't you seen the signs all along the road? No smoking? This is a state forest preserve. Things are unusually dry this season. Oh, Oh, sorry, officer. We were talking and didn't notice the sign. Uh, throw your cigarette away, Harry. Hey, hold it. You throw those butts out of the car and I'll give you both a summons. There's an ashtray in your car. Use it. Sorry, I, I didn't think. Yes, you and plenty of others. Well, all right. Go ahead this time. But don't let me catch you again. You want to burn up 100 square miles of timber? Well, thanks, officer. We'll be careful. All right. Phew. But we had a ticket that time, sure. So did I. Light me another cigarette. You think we better? Sure. He's turning around, going the other way. <laughs> That's right. He only said not to let him catch us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. World full of silly regulations. Hey, what did you do with that match? Why, well, I threw it out the car. Okay. I dropped a match and burned the upholstery once. <laughs> Not many miles distant, in a tower high on the mountainside, forest ranger Joe Thomas is watching the surrounding countryside through his telescope as his telephone rings. High Point Fire Tower. Joe Thomas speaking. Hello, Joe. Take a look at the west quadrant of Section 8, near the State Road. I can see smoke, but it's getting pretty dark. Okay, Jack. Hold on, and I'll take a look through the telescope. Oh, Yes, you're right, Jack. It's in the gully. I can just make out the light over the rim of the ridge. You better call headquarters. That's your section. Jack, keep an eye open, will you? The wind's rising and it'll come your way. Call me back. Okay. Hello, operator. What's the matter, Joe? Lonesome? No time for small talk tonight, Sally. Give me headquarters. Right away. Anything wrong? Not yet. There will be if you don't put me through. All right, don't tell me. I'll listen. Okay. Oh, hi. Well, hello, Jimmy. What brings you up here tonight, son? That's why I brought you. Well, and how many times have I got to tell you not to climb up the tower? If you ever fell off, your mother would give it to me. Ma, shut me, Pop. She'd make an extra pot pie. Take a look. I rode fast and it's still hot. <laughs> well, that's swell. I guess I'll have to forgive you this time. Go ahead, High Point. Headquarters on the wire. Hello. Hello, Chief. I was speaking. Go ahead, High Point. High Point recording fire. West Quadrant, Section 8, near State Road. Maybe Hunter's campfire. West Quadrant, Section 8, near State Road. Check. I'll know the fire road to go. Keep the line open until it's place. Check. You get that operator? Yeah. I will. You can help me by keeping that party line open. Right. You better reach your pot fire for it's cold, Pop. Out of the way, Jimmy. Getting brighter over there. Not a fire? Not sure yet. It looks like it. Oh, it's dry. It's the wind I know it. They turn the shortwave radio on, will you, Jimmy? Sure. What do you want? What's there? Yeah. Let's see it. All right. Here it is. Where's the fire, Pop? About three miles up the valley from our side. Yeah. Listen. Star three reporting. Go ahead, headquarters. Wait a second, Jimmy. Star three reporting. Fire point reports of suspicious fire. Let's put in section eight. Here's the road. West Quadrant, Section 8, near State Road, 
Right. Calling cars one, two, and four. Stand by. Two 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 and four. Stand by. Cars one, two, and four. Stand by. Just a few minutes. Let me look through the telescope, will you, Pop? All right. Then you've got to get out of here. I know. Gee, it's coming up right over there behind the hill. Yeah. I don't like the looks of it. The wind's setting the way it is. You better hit the home. Oh, let me wait till class three calls in, huh? High point. Gentlemen, headquarters. Yes, sir. Power three is investigating. How's it look from the tower? Not so good, sir. Seems to be getting lighter over there. That's that spot. The wind will drive it right down the valley through Jayville. It'll have to jump Pine Creek first. It'll jump it with this wind. And you'll have to dynamite where Pine Creek goes through the notch into the lower valley. I'm figuring on that if the worst comes. If it ever got through the notch, Jayville wouldn't last an hour. Car three calling headquarters. Now hold it, High Point. Car three reporting. I'm getting it here over my shortwave set. Go ahead, car three. With sighted fire, running down valley towards Pine Creek with a notch. Can't handle it. Goodbye. Proceed to fire lane between sections eight and nine. Keep in touch. Okay, headquarters. Calling cars one, two, four, and five. Attention. One, two, four, and five. General alarm. Car one, proceed to dumpster. Pick up volunteer reserve. Join car three. Car two, proceed to Pine Bluff. Pick up reserves and proceed to Pine Creek Bridge. Car four and five, proceed to Jayville and Highland, respectively. Pick up your reserves and proceed to Pine Creek Bridge. Hurry. That is all. Jimmy. Gee, Pop, our place is right in the path of the fire. Get your horse and cut for home. Yes, sir. Get your mother and sister out of there. Take them to the notch, Jayville. They'll never stop this place until it reaches the notch. Even though it'll take dynamite. Right. Take the lower trail. I'll telephone Ma. Get my home, will you, Sally? Please hurry. All the way, Joe. Give me a Joe, the line's dead. Are you sure? The line goes through that section where the fire is reported. The poles must be down. Good grief. Joe, hadn't you better get down there and get Mrs. Thomas and the kids out? Jimmy just left here. I hope he'll make it. I've got to stay on the job. Hour after hour, Joe Thomas sits in the fire tower, his eyes glued to a telescope, watching the raging inferno in the valley below. He sees his home wiped out beneath a wall of flame, riding the wings of the wind. Helpless to aid his family, he must stick to his post. Yes, Joe. Any word about Mrs. Thomas and the kids? No, Joe, I'm sorry. I'll call you as soon as I hear anything. Thanks. Jimmy should have had time to make it. Hold the wire, I think, Joe. Douglas wants to talk to you. Go ahead, Mr. Douglas. Hi, Point. Yes, sir. We've set up headquarters in the notch. How's it look? Will you jump Pine Creek? It has jumped the creek below the bridge. Better get the men back. Yeah, I'm afraid of that. We're getting ready to dynamite the notch. Chief. Yeah? Chief, have you seen my wife and kids? Sorry, Thomas, I haven't. We just got here. They may have gone through the notch toward Gabriel. I'll call you if I see them. Thanks, Chief. Chief! Chief, the Pine Creek Bridge is burning. Well, we've got all our men out of that section. I'll stay on the wire. I've ordered all trucks and patrol cars out through the notch before we blast. I know. I'm getting everything you say over my short wave. Attention all patrol cars. Attention all patrol cars. Get your men through the notch. Get through the notch. Hurry. Any news yet, Sally? Not yet, Joe. Everybody here in Jayville packing their belongings. Well, they'll stop the fire on the notch. They better, or the whole lower valley will go. Well, we'll soon know. I can see the headlights of the patrol cars and trucks going through the notch road. Are they going to dynamite that strip of timber in the notch? Yeah. Yeah, listen, and you'll hear it pretty soon. Fire's almost up to the notch now. Hold on. Yes, sir. One truck is missing. Can you see its lights on the road from your tower? Well, wait a minute. I'll look. No? No? Well, if you're going to blast, you better be quick about it. Yeah, coming in fast on the left side of the canyon. Sorry, Thomas, no word of your wife and kids yet. Keep an eye open for the lights of that truck. Yes, sir. Sally. Yes, Joe. Sally, isn't there any word of my wife and kids? They've got to be in Jayville by now. Ready, Joe. I know Jimmy, he got them out all right. You'll hear soon. Oh, if I could only do something. You ought to be... What's that, Joe? Dynamite. They're clearing the notch. Oh, let's hope it works. You know, fast going on, operator. Thomas. Yes, Chief. Good news for you, fella. Your wife and kids just passed through the notch on that missing truck. The truck was without light. That's why you couldn't see it. Oh, thank heaven. That last one was just for good measure. The fire will never get through the notch now. Oh, say, Joe, don't think I don't know what it meant to you to have to stick up there on that tower. I'll send a relief man to you as soon as I can. Thanks.
like to. Good work, fella. Go on. Men of courage. Men and women whose sense of duty caused them to be forgetful of self. Their names are legion. There are thousands of unsung heroes whose work it is to conserve our forests. Many have given their lives, and their memorials are the green banners of stately trees. Without their ceaseless watch, blackened hills and fire-gutted valleys would lie like ugly scars upon our forests. Men who protect and restore our timberlands, the American cavalcade salutes you. Firefighters in our state and national forests often have good cause to thank chemistry for aid in this important conservation work. Chemistry provides the explosives that are such efficient allies for the men who battle flaming timber and smoldering swamps. The other day, an expert in such work told me of a fire discovered in a peat swamp in Michigan some time ago. It burned for three months before it was finally extinguished. A fire in a peat bog is no joke for it endangers all the surrounding forests. In this swamp, the water level had fallen three feet below the surface, and the fire was burning in the underground peat. The firefighters couldn't find the fire. All the water they pumped in seemed to be useless. In a short time, the blaze would uh, break out in another spot. Finally, some experts on explosives were called in. They surrounded the burning area with a circle of ditching dynamite loaded below the three-foot depth. The blast made a ditch six feet deep, so three feet of it filled with water. The fire was hemmed in on all sides and before long burned itself out. Another use of explosives in forest conservation is in the construction of fire lanes through the heart of the forest. These are wide avenues designed to prevent or at least check the spread of a fire from one section to another. These lanes also permit firefighters to get through the thick woods and brush close to the scene of a fire thus serving the purpose of a road. Their width depends on the size of the timber. Some are as broad as boulevards. In making these lanes, first the trees are cut down and removed, then the stumps are blasted out with dynamite, and all the forest cover on the ground is turned under by blasting and plowing. So there's nothing in the lane that will burn. Explosives also are used to break up hard soil for tree planting, to drain swamps, and to check soil erosion. All such projects help conserve our natural resources. DuPont furnishes such explosives for conservation purposes. And this story serves as another good example of the phrase that guides the work of DuPont research chemists. Better things for better living through chemistry. fame in American literature, stories of Mark Twain and Louisa May Alcott will be told next Wednesday evening at this same time when DuPont again presents The Cavalcade of America. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. WABC, New York.